In the 1930s, American author John W. Campbell wrote the novella Who Goes There under the pen name Don A. Stewart. It was about a team of people trapped in an Antarctic research station with an alien monster that can become a perfect imitation of any living being it comes into contact with. Within the story, they don't refer to the monster as an alien. Instead, they call it The Thing. It was first published in Astounding Science Fiction in August of 1938. On June 24, 1947, amateur pilot Kenneth Arnold was flying his small plane to an air show in Oregon when he saw an unusual bright light in the sky that couldn't be identified. When he landed, he told a friend about what he saw, and the story spread quickly. Arnold's case was the first reported post-war UFO sighting in the U.S., and it sparked a wave of people coming forward who also saw strange saucer-like objects in the sky. Roughly two weeks later, on July 8th, the news exploded with the story of a crashed flying saucer on a ranch in Roswell, New Mexico. This has become one of the most widely discussed events in UFO history. With these two cases happening so close to each other, they altered the future trajectory of science fiction. They heavily influenced the medium, which started a flood of content about unidentified flying objects and aliens. Beyond that, the biggest fear in the U.S. at the time was communism. The Russians had the hydrogen bomb, and this drove much of the Cold War paranoia reflected in 50s sci-fi. Writer, producer, and director Howard Hawks' career in cinema started all the way back in 1910 with independent films before making movies for Hollywood decades later. He was in Heidelberg, Germany in 1948, shooting a film called I Was a Male War Bride. While there, he was in an army PX and found a copy of Who Goes There? With everything going on in the world, the novella piqued his interest. While working on I Was a Male War Bride, he hired a new actor for a small part. The actor was starstruck that he was in a film with Cary Grant, so for his character, he just mimicked everything that Grant did. The director loved this, and his small role was extended from a few days to a few weeks. After filming, Hawks pulled the actor aside and told him, I'm gonna star you in a picture one of these days. The actor, Ken Toby, was happy but figured it was just talk and nothing would come of it. Once I Was a Male War Bride was finished, Hawks turned all his attention into creating an adaptation of Who Goes There. Charles Lederer wrote War Bride, and Hawks brought him back to write this. They decided to call the movie The Thing. Hawks decided to produce The Thing, and he offered the directing job to Christian Nyby. Nyby had been working as an editor for Hawks since 1944's To Have and Have Not. Nyby said, I edited so many of Howard's films, especially Red River, where I had to edit 100,000 feet of film. Howard felt he owed me a favor. I wanted to be a director. Howard knew this and helped me get my first credit with The Thing. While Hawks liked the story of who goes there, as production got closer, he and Nyby implemented numerous changes. It was also rumored that Hawks' friends Ben Hecht and William Faulkner helped with some of the rewrites of the script. They removed all the imitation aspects of the original story. Also, the thing was no longer telepathic. The script as it was now had very little in common with the original story. The only major elements that made it were the crash saucer, the dogs, the alien, and the Arctic Research Station. They planned to produce the film under Hawks' Winchester Pictures Corporation and distribute through RKO Pictures. In 1948, RKO was acquired by film tycoon Howard Hughes. Hughes had a working relationship with Hawks, producing some of his films like Scarface and Hell's Angels. While RKO is not well known now, back in the 40s it was considered one of the big five studios of Hollywood's golden age. Hughes wasn't signed on as a producer for the film, but as the head of the studio, he kept a close eye on things. Crew members said that while he wasn't directly involved, he made his presence felt. He had certain stipulations things he did and didn't want in the movie. One major thing with Hughes was that he didn't want the alien to just be a big monster like in Frankenstein. Hawks wrote a memo to Hughes to assure him that the thing would not end up being a gothic horror film like Frankenstein. In Letterer's original script, the monster was a weird shape-shifting creature, much like it was in Who Goes There. It was described as a blue-skinned monstrosity with three red eyes, a sucker mouth, and stringy hair. The body would pulsate and shift around as it formed into whatever creature it absorbed. Unfortunately, they didn't have the budget to make something this elaborate and scrapped the idea. The designer in charge of the look of the thing, Lee Greenway, 
presented Hawks with different makeup designs for his approval. He tried various methods and makeups, but nothing seemed to please the producer. Weeks were going by, and they couldn't decide on a proper look for the monster. Finally, after some time, Hawks told him, Just make the monster look like Frankenstein. For the part of the thing, they hired actor James Arness. While he'd later go on to be known for Matt Dillon and Gunsmoke, in 1950, he was still a newcomer to the industry with only a few acting credits to his name. At six foot seven, they gave him lifts in his shoes to bring him almost to seven feet tall. They spent some time working on the outfit for the thing before finally landing on a fairly simple silver suit with green makeup, which did make him look similar to Frankenstein's monster. The big addition to the story was that they theorized the alien was composed of intelligent plant life. This explained why they could repeatedly shoot it and fail to kill it, as well as how it regrew any limbs that were cut off. Sounds like you're trying to describe a vegetable. I am. That could be why the bullets fired by Sergeant Bond had no seeming effect. In keeping with Hawks' usual pro-military themes, he added these serious, no-nonsense military men to the script. The officers are all calm under pressure, while the doctor is presented as a lunatic who's willing to sacrifice any of their lives in the pursuit of science. The movie takes place in Anchorage, Alaska. A military research team find a spaceship frozen in ice. Outside the ship, they find a large alien creature, which they bring back to the base, where it thaws out and proceeds to rampage through and kill anyone that gets in the way. The novella was more horror with thriller elements such as the thing hiding amongst the humans, with them not knowing who to trust. There was none of that in the new script, which ended up being more of a siege film in the second half, with the alien trying to get to the humans so it can drink their blood. It was more action sci-fi, although it did channel the fear of aliens, as well as a dose of paranoia fueled by the Cold War. While still in pre-production, Nyby and Hawks came to an agreement. The film would be very unique in that it would have no close-up shots. Almost all the scenes would be done continuously, and they agreed to film the movie in sequence. When it came to casting, Hawks was a man of his word and hired Kenneth Toby to play the lead role of Captain Patrick Hendry. Much of the rest of the cast was filled out by actors that Hawks or Nyby were familiar with. Bill Self taught Hawks' son how to play tennis. George Fenneman was Nyby's next-door neighbor. Dewey Martin was signed on to do Hawks' The Big Sky, which was on hold due to one of their stars, Montgomery Clift, panicking and disappearing. Martin was working on a salary, so Hawks put him in the thing in the meantime. This was back in the day when studios had actors working on a salary, and a very in-demand actor could make as much as $850 a week. Hawks brought in other actors like Robert Corthwaite and Douglas Spencer. Margaret Sheridan, who played the love interest for the captain, was strangely given top billing despite this being her first film. She was a fashion model that attracted the attention of Hawks, who signed her to a five-picture deal with his studio. They were looking into locations for the film and settled on a few different places. They planned to shoot in North Dakota, as well as Montana and areas in California. Since they couldn't very well film in Alaska, they built sets inside of an ice house at Glacier National Park in Los Angeles, so you'd be able to see the actor's breath. For some exterior shots, they needed a place with lots of snow. They looked up weather reports that said that Cutbank, Montana, got an average of 20 feet of snow per year. They all agreed this would be the best place to build their Arctic base. They picked a large flat area as their build location. There was an Air Force runway there, and they took up some of the space at the end of the runway. The carpenters were constructing the base when some local kids stopped by and asked what they were doing. We're building a movie set. What's all that white stuff? It's so when it snows, it'll look like snow. It doesn't snow here. What? The weather report said Cutbank gets 20 feet a year. Yeah, but it doesn't snow here. As it turns out, they picked the one area in Cutbank that doesn't get snow, which was why the Air Force built a runway there. They spoke to some locals who told them that even if it does snow there, the wind blows it away every morning. The crew then worked to turn the Archeo Ranch into the North Pole with whatever they could, flour, paint, white sheets, and so on. The studio estimated the shoot would only take a few weeks, so they set the budget fairly low. With the film cast and the sets built, they prepared to shoot in late October of 1950. They flew out to Cutbank and waited on it to snow. And waited. And waited. After a week, they flew everyone back. Eight weeks went by, and there was no snow. 
They sent everyone out to rehearse in the hotel while they were waiting for snow. This helped with the camaraderie of the cast since they spent most of their time playing poker. In the meantime, they filmed new background shots like an overhead one of the crash saucer. Nybe was annoyed because they had to get the shots quickly, and you could see the guys clearing the area with the snowplow. To conceal their surroundings, they had a cyclorama, which is a panoramic image inside of a large cylinder. When filmed, it can give the illusion of a full 360 degree landscape. One day they were prepping for the shot of the saucer blowing up on the RKO lot. The FX guy loaded it with powder and left it overnight. The next morning it was damp, and he figured the powder was wet and unusable, so he packed it with more. When they set up the shot, the explosion went off and was much larger than anyone was anticipating. The RKO lot was in the middle of San Fernando Valley. The explosion went off at 11 p.m., and everyone in the surrounding area panicked. The smoke cloud from the explosion looked like a mushroom cloud. Dick Kinnon, the script clerk, said that everyone was on full alert and thought, This is it! The Cold War had everyone on edge, thinking we could be nuked into oblivion at any given moment. The explosion was so big, the camera jolted, and you could see the California skyline behind the cyclorama. They couldn't afford to shoot it again, so they had to leave the mistake in the film. While the team was working on the film, Charles Randolph released a song called The Thing, which became very popular. RKO didn't want any confusion or comparisons, so they added the From Another World to the title. As a joke, the RKO publicity department printed up business cards for the cast that said, No, I am not the thing. Everyone got one, except James Arness. Since they were shooting on the RKO lot, they had to make some script changes to accommodate the alterations of the shooting schedule. The Thing's demise was not as effective as they had envisioned. The optical chief, Lynn Dunn, took the footage and drew the lightning bolts that shot out and fried the monster. As the Thing's melting, they switched out James Arness to a little person in a scaled-down version of the costume. Eventually, between the RKO ranch and cut bank, they were able to get the shots they needed. Initially, the shoot was supposed to be short. With all the problems they had, they didn't stop filming until March 3, 1951. The Thing from Another World was released on April 27, 1951 and was a very big hit. It grossed almost $2 million and was the 46th biggest grossing film of the year, beating other future sci-fi classics like The Day the Earth Stood Still and When Worlds Collide. The movie went on to be a huge influence in other sci-fi films. They had what's considered the first time the movie had a beeping Geiger counter, which became a staple of science fiction in following years. One of the biggest was how it was updated for use in the movie Alien as the motion tracker. The movie also was one of the first to do what is called a full burn. They had the stuntman in a special asbestos lined suit with 30 seconds of oxygen. Despite popular belief, the room wasn't filled with stuntmen. They used the real actors for the scene, except the stuntman in the thing suit and the guy who throws the kerosene who was the other stuntman. Hawks and Nybe didn't want to show too much of the thing. When you do see him, He's always partially obscured, either by smoke or shadows or both. Electricity was used to kill the thing, which ended up being used to kill numerous movie monsters after this. The film ends with this line. Keep watching the sky. Which ended up becoming one of the most quoted and well-known lines in sci-fi movie history. James Arness wasn't happy with the film and disowned it after its release. He said he thought he was going to be a scary monster, but instead he looked like a giant carrot. This was intentional, though, on the part of the filmmakers. They even stressed this early on. Just as though you're describing some form of super Karen. Arness was completely embarrassed by it and refused to discuss the film in interviews. In 1972, Spanish director Eugenio Martin adapted Who Goes There as Horror Express, which was an even further departure from the source material. Instead of an Arctic base... It takes place on the Trans-Siberian Express that comes under attack by a prehistoric ape, which is a host for a life form that's absorbing the minds of the passengers and crew. In 1978, William F. Nolan, one of the authors of Logan's Run, wrote a treatment for a potential remake for Universal. His version was even further from the source material and played out more like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. A young John Carpenter saw the thing from another world in theaters. It was a huge influence on him, and one of the reasons why he became a director. He even studied it in college for his cinema classes. While working on his third film, Halloween, 
Carpenter used clips from The Thing as the movie playing on TV. In 1980, producer Wilbur Stark bought the rights to numerous old RKO films with the intention of remaking them, the biggest of which was The Thing from Another World. His intention with this one was to make a version that was more faithful to the source. He hired John Carpenter to direct, who was overjoyed since the original was one of his all-time favorite movies. As a promotional tie-in for both films, writer-director, movie aficionado, and fan of the original Ted Newsom tried to get as many of the living cast and crew from the original to attend a Thing from Another World reunion. Everyone loved the idea, except for Universal, who were releasing John Carpenter's film. Newsom called the head of special projects at Universal, Mick Garris, and explained his idea. Garris said he liked the idea and he'd love to attend, but here's what the studio reaction will be. They're going to say ours is a completely new picture and we don't want to draw comparisons. Newsom spoke to various studio heads who said exactly this. He tried to get in touch with the publicity department, but no one ever returned his calls. On June 25th, John Carpenter's The Thing was released. Wanting to try one last time, Newsom calls Universal and suggests the reunion could work as a second wave of publicity for the new movie. The staffer says, That might be pretty good, but the movie hasn't opened too well. They might not want to do anything more. I'll bring it up in a meeting today. Newsom never heard back from them. After countless calls and numerous headaches, the reunion took place on June 5, 1982. They gathered as many from the original as they could, including George Fenneman, who played Redding, Robert Corthwaite, the evil Dr. Carrington, Kenneth Toby, the hero, Captain Pat Henry, Christian Nyby, the director, and William Self, who played Corporal Barnes. He was now the new president of CBS's theatrical film division. Sadly, Margaret Sheridan, who played Nikki, died of lung cancer on May 1st, just a few months before the reunion. As a way to honor her, they invited her husband, Paul Wildman, and their two daughters, Eileen and Julia. They had a special cake made. Originally, they wanted a carrot cake, but decided on chocolate. On the cake, it says, 31 years, the mind boggles. The Thing, happy anniversary. They also had the prop arm of The Thing on loan. They screened the original, and the audience loved it. Afterwards, they had a Q&A. They answered all sorts of questions about the production for the happy crowd of several hundred people. Bill Self said as a producer, his only regret was that he didn't think of remaking the thing before someone else did. Speaking of, one person asked Nyby if he saw the remake. He saw it and made it clear that he did not like it. He said, if you want blood, go to a slaughterhouse. There are other ways to be effective. How many times can you see something split in two or three and remain scared? And why end with a down ending? All those guys are going to freeze to death now? All in all, it's a terrible commercial for J&B Scotch. It seemed most reviewers agreed with Nyby. Vincent Canby from the New York Times called it too phony looking to be disgusting. It qualifies only as instant junk. Roger Ebert was disappointed by the superficial characterizations and implausible behavior and called the film an alien knockoff. He stated that it was the barf bag movie of July. And I would call this the barf bag movie of July. I have some problems with it. One of them is, I think, the characters. They're not made into three-dimensional people. Their function is to walk down the corridor and be jumped on. Because this material has been done before and better, especially in the original Thing and in Alien, there's no need to see this version unless you're interested in what the Thing might look like while starting from anonymous greasy organs extruding from giant crab legs and transmuting itself into a dog. John Carpenter's movie was a horrendous flop at the time, but that's a story for another video. The other big question at the Q&A was something that had been out there for a long time, and that was, who really directed the film? Hawks or Nyby? Nyby said, That's one of the most inane and ridiculous questions I've ever heard, and people keep asking. They say it was Hawks' style. Of course it was. This was a man I studied and wanted to be like. You'd certainly emulate and copy the master you're sitting under, which I did. Despite him saying this, there are still doubts about it, with some of the cast even saying it was Nyby who directed, while others say it was Hawks. Two days after the event, and Newsom finally got a return call from somebody at Universal. They said, I talked to the head man at the publicity department. He thought it was a great idea, and that they could have used the publicity. He wanted to know why you didn't get in touch with them. 
In 1991, Dark Horse Comics published several miniseries called The Thing from Another World, which was a continuation of the John Carpenter thing, despite being named after the first movie. They are definitely worth reading if you can find them. In 2006, Dark Horse released a model kit of the alien, as the way it was described in the original novella. The model was unlicensed, and simply titled, The Space Thing. You better believe I got one. In 2018, it was discovered there was a longer version of Who Goes There, written by Campbell, called Frozen Hell. It was discovered in a box of manuscripts that Campbell sent to Harvard University. Author and biographer Alec Navala Lee found the script while researching authors from the golden age of science fiction. After the success Blumhouse has had with the late sequels for the Halloween films, they purchased the rights to Frozen Hell and planned on remaking John Carpenter's version of The Thing while incorporating material from Frozen Hell with input from the director. Who Goes There has been reprinted numerous times since 1938, and in 1973, it was voted by the American Science Fiction Writers of America as one of the stories representing the most influential, important, and memorable science fiction that has ever been written. Along with that, The Thing from Another World is considered one of the most important sci-fi films ever made. While they made drastic changes from the source material, which usually leads to disaster, it didn't in this case. It was a far cry from the source, but they made so many wise decisions about how to do the film, it succeeded in honoring the source while still being something different. The Thing from Another World is great sci-fi. There are some technical problems, and yes, I do prefer John Carpenter's The Thing. That's one of my all-time favorite movies. However, this is a fantastic film that overcame its problems, and it's amazing when you consider that they managed to scare the hell out of audiences in the 50s with a giant sentient carrot. as you call it, has constructed an aircraft capable of flying some millions of miles through space, propelled by a force as yet unknown to us. An intellectual carrot, the mind boggles. Shouldn't. 